Today is January 24th, 2018, the year of Benaiah Othniel Stevens. We have a lot to celebrate. And so today, I couldn't think of a better way to do that than talk about direct and succeeding under supervision. And I can't help but think we didn't quite get where we needed to in worship. You guys agree? Yes. We got some more ground to cover. Yeah, Why don't we uh, jump over to Jeremiah 20, verse 9. And when you get there, say, nailed it. That's going to be very important for this word. Yeah, nailed it. Nailed it. <laughs> All right, verse 9. But if I say, I will not mention him or speak any more in his name, his word is in my heart like a fire, a fire shut up in my bones. I am weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. Is there fire in your bones tonight? Yeah. Is there fire in your bones tonight? Yes. Is there anyone here who wants to charge the gates of hell? Yes. Where are my men that don't give a damn about anything but the Lord's glory? My DCD men. Yes. Where are the DCD women in the house? Yes. Amen. <laughs> Turn in your Bible to Exodus 20. We're going to talk about a man who was DCD. Exodus 20, verse 21. Nailed it. Nailed it. Nailed it. Nailed it. Nailed it. Yes, there we go. This is discipleship of my wife, making sure that she gets where she needs to go. <laughs> the people remained at a distance while Moses approached the thick darkness where God was. The courage of Moses should stir our hearts. While people cowered in fear, Moses marched on into the presence of God and received the teaching that was to be brought down from the mountain and given to the people. Pastors and leaders are a special breed of men who have a deep-rooted passion for the glory of the Lord. They are not concerned with their health, wealth, or prosperity, not even of their own skin. They're willing to lay everything down, even their own life, to be in the presence of the Lord. And once they have received from the Lord in that secret meeting place, it is their joy to lavish the revelation on the ones God has entrusted to them. Amen. If we do not take from the throne of God the gospel, and the truth of the scripture. <clears throat> and uh, men remain, if we don't take from the scripture and share with men, they remain in their unregenerate, lost, damned state. And it's up to us. Tonight we're going to focus on how teachers help us with divine direction. Say divine direction. Divine direction. And how they successfully drive us sometimes kindly, sometimes not, into our call. Amen. And how the disciple benefits from the discipler. Backtrack a little bit to Exodus 17 and put your finger on verse 9. Nailed it. Nailed it. Amen. Rob's there. I noticed something interesting in the scripture and I want to share it with you tonight. Moses said to Joshua, choose some of our men to go out and fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow, I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. Amen. You see, Moses on the mountain, Joshua in the valley fighting. Moses was reaching into the heavens, grabbing hold of the throne of God as his disciple fought. And the relationship between Moses grabbing the throne and Joshua had a direct correlation to each other. If Moses wasn't grabbing onto the throne, Joshua wasn't thriving. And it took the help of Aaron and Hur, but when he grabbed hold, even with the help of his brothers, Joshua succeeded. 
Do you, does anyone remember the Yahweh Nisi, the Lord is my banner, yes. study from Exodus 17? Yeah. I want to remind you of some of the paleo. Nisi is made up of a noon and a samic. Noon meaning sun or continue, uh, and samic meaning grab. To continue to grab hold yes. of the throne. And as Moses took hold of his banner, he helped Joshua do the same. But Moses had to do it first. And his ability to grab the revelation from heaven was Joshua's success as he implemented it in his life. Amen. As we progress through this discipleship process, there is a type of heavenly exchange from God to the rabbi and from the rabbi to the disciple. I'm going to share with you one of my favorite scriptures. It's Deuteronomy 32. When you get there, you can say, nailed it. Nailed it. Nailed it. We're going to start in verse 1. Getting used to uh, preaching now, I think. It's, we're not, uh, you're not repeating everything that I'm saying. You're doing a great job. Let's start in verse 1. Listen, O heavens, and I will speak. Hear, O earth, to the words of my mouth. Let my teaching fall like rain, and my words descend like dew, like showers on new grass, like abundant rain on tender plants. Do you think Moses believe that his teaching came from his own strength no. or that it was like rain from the heavens being poured out on him wow. and now the song that he's singing that God told him to, wrote, or to write he's describing as dew and showers on new grass Amen. abundant rain on tender plants so Moses is receiving from the heavens it's being poured onto him and he's pouring it out on the people and he's He's encouraging the people to take that teaching and to hold to it because there are promises associated with holding to the word of God. There are also consequences. And we can never separate the two. If we go out and preach the gospel and it's all promises and all blessing, then of course people will be uh, herded together into large churches because there is no consequence for not obeying it. It's something that can be flippantly put in your back pocket and used whenever it's beneficial to you. But when we preach promises and wrath, promises and judgment and a just God, then people begin to grab hold of their own faith walk and implement the word in their own life. They begin to take ownership because it's up to them. It's up to us. So I want to share uh, how this scripture has impacted my life. Let's go to verse 3. It says, I will proclaim the name of the Lord. Oh, praise the greatness of our God. <laughs> Amen. This is, in fact, my mezuzah. Part of it. I'm growing into my calling and what the Lord is doing in my life. But this is what I know he's made me to do. To proclaim the greatness of God among the nations. Amen. And I'll tell you where this began to develop. So two years ago, uh, my wife and I dawned to the doors of this church, living in Houston, newly married, and uh, we had entered into discipleship, and we came up to the New Year's bonfire. I know many of you have had your, your life changed radically at the New Year's Eve bonfire, but I'll challenge you if it was as radically changed as mine. I received a prophecy that said I was to pick up my guitar and start playing in my home, start worshiping everywhere that I go, and that I would pay, play a significant part. I would be an integral piece uh, of a three-part team that would unlock nations. Yeah. We say amen now. I had no idea what that meant. <laughs> I had all the plans in the world. My, my wife and I, we were going to move to Oklahoma. We had big plans. We had big business to deal with. But there was something about what I knew God was telling me to do, what the teachers were hearing from the heavens, 
and pouring out onto me, and it required something. It required me to die. It required me to let go of every plan, every ambition, every, every goal, every good thing I thought I wanted for myself. I had to lay it all down. I had to let it die and be buried really deep, concreted over, barricaded, chicken wired, skyscraper built on top of it, and a helipad where I can never get back to that wretched, pitiful way of life. Let's go to verse 4. He is the rock. His works are perfect. And all his ways are just. A faithful God who does no wrong. Upright and just is he. We serve a just God who is a rock. Amen? Amen. Say, he is a rock. rock. Say, rock. Rock. Kazak. Amats. Amen. Let's go to the book of Isaiah. When you get to Isaiah 50, find a verse 4. Verse 4, the sovereign Lord has given me an instructed tongue to know the word that sustains the weary. He awakens me morning by morning, wakens my ear to listen to, uh, listen like one being taught. The sovereign Lord has opened my ears and I have not been rebellious. I have not drawn back. My question to you is have you? Have you been rebellious? As a member in this church, as a proclaimed disciple or a proclaimed Christian, have you been rebellious? Have you drawn back? Have you become cowardice in your workplace, in your studies, in your relationships, maybe with your wife or your brothers? You've cowered from the instructed tongue that the Lord gave you the moment he filled you with his spirit. You know we can hear from God. You want to hear from God. Yes. And when we hear from him, we have an obligation to speak it, to make it manifest on earth. And when we don't, we sin. We are rebellious and we draw back from the very thing God wants to do in our life. And it is true. If we do not rise up to the things that God is trying to do in our life and wants to do in our life, that he prepared in advance for us to do, if we don't take hold of that, he will raise up another because his name will be glorified whether in your life righteously or in your death as being unrighteous. He will get his glory. Let's go to Ecclesiastes 12. This is one of my favorite passages of Scripture. Verse 11, the words of the wise are like goads. Love that word. (laughs) They're collected sayings like firmly embedded nails given by one shepherd. But be warned, my son, of anything in addition to them. I want to share with you something uh, from Rashi. He says, Just as this goad directs the cow to its furrows, so do their words direct a person to the ways of life. The words of your teacher are the way to life. We hear Jesus speaking to Paul in his great conversion. He appears to him on the road and he says, Paul, why do you kick against the goads? Why do you kick against the very things that my law taught you? You are rebellious. You have drawn back from the very thing that I've called you to do. And out of an act of grace, he struck him with blindness so that he would wake up. Amen. About fast and nails, this is what Rashi says. Just as this nail is fastened, so are their words fastened, i.e. permanent, 
just as a sapling is fruitful and multiplies. So their words fruitful are fruitful and multiply, and they find for them a reason. The words of your teachers should bear fruit in your life like a fastened nail in your heart. Unmovable, unchanged, bearing fruit 30, 60, and 100 fold, day after day, showing up in your marriage, showing up in the way that you parent, showing up in the way that we worship, showing up in the way that we show reverence to God. Indeed, you can hear from God, from his spirit when you're born again. But let's not forget that your teachers, your pastors in this church, your brothers who have been doing this way longer than you, they're going to show you exactly how a righteous man walks, how a righteous man worships. And when we truly grab hold of this teaching is life for me, this teaching will bear fruit in my life, we no longer sit in worship services that are dead. We no longer have to trust on bold men who rise up and say, there is sin in the room. There is sin in the room. Thankfully, today we had a pastor that said, you can live victoriously. We got to wake up. Amen. We have to wake up. Amen. Let's go to John 8, 31. Amen. There. And thinking about... Uh, as you're getting there, verse 31. When I think about this teaching bearing fruit, and this is before we get to John A, just a brief aside. A lot of times when I speak to people about the gospel, I think we need to go help these poor people because they're just waiting. They're waiting for the gospel to be given to them. They're hungry. They, they are ready to receive the teaching that I received and bear fruit. That may not be true. They may love their sin. They may be completely oblivious to the light of Christ. Unless you go and wake them up, they will remain sleepers damned to hell for the rest of your life while you sit on your blessed assurance doing nothing. We have to take the teachings that are being brought forth from this pulpit and implement them in our lives immediately. Amen. That means when someone says repent because this is in the room and it is you and you sit there stone cold dead, it is because you are stone cold dead. Don't try to fool anyone with righteous fig leaves. You have to have a soft heart. And if I read a scripture like there is fire in his bones and Jeremiah can't hold it in and you relate to that and you're... You're, you're fired up, amen, but if you do not react to the scripture, how can you say that your heart is alive? How can you say that you're moved by the spirit of God when his very spirit is speaking to him, to you from his word? And even more personal than that, you can fool yourself reading a book if you view it as such. But if you're talking to a pastor through counseling and you're sitting with a group of three men, maybe one, maybe two, and they can counsel you and give you jewels of wisdom in the form of biblical teaching. And you spit it out of your mouth. Where does that leave you? I think Jesus would have something to say about it. But let's go to John 31. Or 831. Verse 31, to the Jews who had believed in him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teachings, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Do you want to hold to the teachings today? Yes. You know, if you hold to the teachings, it proves that you are a disciple. If you can look at your life and say, I have all this fruit that is a complete blessing because I held to the teachings, you can say you are a disciple. But if you, you have no proof or evidence, you're like a, a, a flailing bird in air just waiting to hit the ground, how can you say that you're even saved? We have to be anchored to something, and those teachings, like weighty stones, anchor us to the ground. Amen. I have a, a, a cool quote for, for you from the Pirkei Avot. It says, Yossi ben Yoser, men of Srida, and Yossi ben Yohanan, man of Jerusalem, received from him like a rabbi to his disciple. Yossi ben Yozer says, 
May your house be a meeting house for sages. May you become dirty in the dust of their feet and drink their words thirstily. You know, Matt, Wade, Eric, I love hearing from them. Love sitting at their home and letting them pour out their teachings, don't you? Yeah. Every little question they have an answer for. How closely have you been walking with them? Are you sneaking into their home, even though it might be a little inconvenient for them? But do you do it anyways because you know it means life for you? It means fruitfulness for you. It means fruitfulness not only for you, but maybe for your wife and children. And more importantly, for the people whom God wants to send you to. We have to be so close that we get covered in the whatever it is the pastors kick up. (laughs) Yossi Ben Yoser was probably kicking up dust, but our pastors kick up a lot more than just dust. We have to view discipleship as a full contact sport. Amen. Where you're walking so closely that you're stepping on their heels, you're, you're rubbing up against them, you're, you're bumping their shoulders, or for me, bumping their waist and their kneecaps. <laughs> it has to be close. And you may, get, you may get knocked down a little bit. They're strong men. You, you may get stepped on. They may push you to get them, like, get out of my way. You have to imagine two people walking so closely together that it's not actually functionally possible. This should be our desire to our our pastors and our elders. I want to share with you a story uh, that some of you Acts 1 students will really, really enjoy. So you're going to approach a class called apologetics. And uh, without spilling the beans... Let's just say, you will learn apologetics as taught by the pastors. So we had like a 16-hour teaching on apologetics. <laughs> my butt was numb. My eyes were bleeding. My throat was sore. But they had poured out a thorough teaching. I don't think there was a corner of that teaching that was dark. It had all been illuminated to its fullest. And it was time to put into practice the things that they had been teaching me. And so I am a little ambitious. I took on all three of the pastors. They picked the subject and said, okay, give us an apologetic string that proves we're wrong or that the scripture is right. Go both ways. And after all this teaching and after all that instruction, this is what I did. They asked me a question. So I asked them a question. They asked me a question. I asked them a question. Now what you may not know, because you haven't reached that part in the class, they say, you don't need to converse with them. The word is enough. The word's the champion. The word's going to bring light to the darkness. The word's going to crush anything that sets itself up against it. It is a dominant force, like a hurricane. I wish I would have known what I know now then. I got so smashed. I got my fanny spanked. I got rebuked publicly. Why? <laughs> First of all, the pastors, they, I know they love me. They want good things for me. They want me to be able to do what I'm doing right now effectively and convey a message that changes people's lives, that can lead someone into salvation. They want that for me, and I know it. But I deviated it. So I took a little bit of direction from them. (laughs) And it goes without saying, but it's embarrassing to say and hear, we just told you not to do what you just did. I made another mistake. I said, I know. I remember the teaching. And then, you know, they started scowling. I did what I wanted to. (laughs) I did what I wanted to. And very kindly, but in a way that shrunk me, I said, don't do that again. And what that produced in me was a desire never to do that again. (laughs) That's my short story. But I hope hope you see that your teachers don't want to hurt you. They don't want to hell brimstone and fire like... On your life, they want to see you do well, and they love you. It's like a shepherd tending after a sheep. Uh, 
So there, there's, there's some light and some heavy in discipleship. You may, you may have some rough times. You may have to wrestle. You may have to get rebuked and be embarrassed and have your selfish pride crushed. Amen. Amen. But many times, they're just going to direct you. And if you're humble enough to just take that direction, you'll go much further than if you fight and kick against the goads. Let's, uh, let's jump over to uh, Philippians 3. And when you get to Philippians 3, verse 17. It says, join with others in following my example, brothers, and take note of those who live according to the pattern we gave you. What does your peer group look like? Are you the superstar? Are you the strongest among your brothers or the people that you associate yourself with? Do you like to be the big shot, the strong one, the one that has the answers? Well, unless you are the rabbi, you may be in the wrong group of people. Amen. We need to surround ourselves with brothers and sisters who are stronger than us, yeah. who yeah. are going to go further than us, and they're going to pull us up along with them. Let's, Let's think of the man who was uh, lame at the gate called Beautiful. Yeah. And Peter and John are there, and they grab him by his right hand, they pull him to his feet. Let me ask you, tonight, do you need to be pulled to your feet? Yeah. Is there anyone who needs to be pulled to their feet? Yeah. On, Amen. Paul? Timo? Nick needs to be pulled to his feet, then you need to surround yourself with people who are strong enough to pull you to your feet and carry you along. Amen. Fellowship is everything. Discipleship is life. And we have to hold to the teachings that are being passed on to us in this church. Amen. And in case you're, you know, you're, you're trying to find out what the sowed is, there is no sowed in this. Eric. Matt, Wade, pastors of LCM, what they teach you, what you receive from Elder Charlie and Elder Baj, what they teach you, that is life. There is no sowed. It's not what you, you find on a Facebook post or on the back of a shirt and you're saying Jesus is discipling you. Indeed, his word is teaching you. But the pastors are receiving from the heavens like Moses and their relationship with the Father has a direct correlation to your success. But if you don't hold to the teachings because you're being discipled by some mythical unicorn, I'll leave it at that. Let's go to Revelation 2. That's a good word, Revelation. Nailed it. Nailed it. Nailed it. Nailed it. Nailed it. Verse 24. Now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, to you who do not hold to her teachings and have not learned Satan's so-called secrets, I will not impose any other burden on you. Only hold on to what you have until I come. To him who overcomes and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. Wow. Let that sink in. Feel the weight on your shoulders, the authority over a nation. And Jesus wants to give it to you. And how are you qualified to carry such a weight? Hold on to what you have and overcome and Amen. do his will. Amen. If we buy into these teachings for, from peddlers of prophet these sages on stages that set themselves up as great men of God, if we buy into what they teach because it's comfortable, it's convenient, it fits into our lifestyle, it's what we've always done. We've been at this church for 20 plus years. If you buy into it, you may be buying in to one of Satan's so-called secrets. And he's keeping you at bay because if you knew the teachings that he wanted to give you and you held to them, you would be qualified to have authority over a nation. Amen. 
But let's digress from authority over the nations. How much divine direction would you want if you were entrusted to just rule over uh, a church? Or maybe a group of churches like the one association? Less responsibility. But do you feel like you could handle that? Like you're ready? How's your family doing? Have you even been able to hold your family together? To teach them the things that God is sharing with you? What about you and your wife? Husbands? Is your wife receiving from the heavens the things that you're receiving? Now, if you think that you're always the second party, for those in <clears throat> heated discipleship, if you feel like, oh, I only can take what the, the pastors, uh, you know, they get, and then I, I implement it in my life, and that's discipleship now. The very thing that they teach is how to hear from God and do His will, yeah. how to make right sacrifices. Right. Hear from God and obey what He told you to do, Amen. and do it the first time. Wow. Slow obedience is no obedience. Amen. If you're convicted that I ask you how your wife is doing, husbands, how are you doing? Have you been studying the word? Do you have a renewed relationship every morning with his word? Do you spend time in prayer and in worship? Do you, when's the last time you broke down in tears because his word so moved on you? Because the king of kings thought you were worth speaking to. I know many of you in this room desire to have the Lord speak to you. And it's, it's always that under your breath prayer, God, I want to know what your will is. I want to know where I'm called to, what I'm called to. I want to know uh, how to be a better man, how to be a better Christian. I'll tell you this. Just whispering under your breath isn't enough. You may have to actually work with the things God has put in your life and begin to implement them, a.k.a. the teachings of your pastors. They are giving you everything you need to hear from him. Like Justin taught us, we got something. We got something. If you could handle the little things, like yourself or your wife or your family or your local church, or your association of churches, and you overcome, the Lord will give you authority over the nations. Amen. Amen. Let's jump to Mark 8, verse 17. Nailed it. Nailed it. Nailed it. It says, aware of their discussion, Jesus asked them, why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Can you imagine Jesus? He's, he's like, I, I just fed 5,000 people and we, we fed 4,000 people. You're worried about bread? I multiplied by the thousands. Where is your understanding? The disciples set out to implement what Jesus had lavished on them, to do what he said. They were walking the walk. They were going after it. Or as some would say, they were going hard in the paint. <laughs> Yet Jesus still had to give them direction. And this correction shows the love a rabbi has for his Talmud. It has nothing to do with pampering their feelings or making them appear as champions or even boasting or even boosting their confidence, has everything to do with making them holy and a model for future disciples. Amen. Are you a spiritual snowflake? <laughs> do you melt at the heat of offense? Wow. Ask that again. <laughs> do you melt at the heat of offense? Does your snowflake life crumble when the pastors or your brothers suggest that you might be slightly off, like you're not thriving in discipleship, and as an act of love, 
not of judgment. They want to lift you up and say, hey, you are not progressing. You're not doing what you said you were going to do last week, let alone last year. They're stacking up against you. Wake up. Does that hurt you? It is quiet. That's it, a good word. It, we've all been there. We've all had that brother come and throw his arm around us in loving fashion and say, you're being dumb. <laughs> like, I can't believe... I mean, you said it, so, I mean, I believe you said it, but you really think that's right? You're not for anyone. And then you get all heated up with offense, and your, your life melts. There's no snowflakes that are going to make it into the kingdom of God. Amen. Amen. Only Holy Ghost-filled savages. There's a scripture we all like. It's Luke 16, 16. The kingdom of God is forcibly advancing. And forceful men are forcing them way, their way into it. Yes. Do you feel forceful tonight? Yes. Are you ready to crush sin in your life? Yes. Are you ready to take hold of the teachings that are being lavished on you? Amen. Yes. Amen. I want to make a comment about when you're directed by your pastors. Humility to admit, when you're, to admit when you're wrong or receive correction from our teachers or the, receive the correction that our teachers lavish on us, it does not hinder the gospel. It furthers it. Amen. Your ability to admit your fault and to receive correction is not a failure and it does not hinder the gospel. It furthers it. Amen. Your ability to take direction means that you have the ability to be directed to the kingdom and direct others once your discipleship is complete. That's good. Humility is everything. Yeah. Let's go to Luke 9. It's a good word. Nailed it. Nailed it. Nailed it. Of the things I've studied this week, this is one of the scriptures that spoke to me the most. Let's start in verse 9. When Jesus had called the twelve together, he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. He told them, take nothing for your journey. No staff, no bag, no bread, no money, no extra tunic. Whatever house you enter, stay there until you leave that town. If people do not welcome you, shake the dust off your feet as you leave that town, uh, when you leave that town as a testimony against them. Wow. So they set out and went from village to village, preaching the gospel and healing people everywhere. Amen. As I'm looking at this list, I found some really encouraging things. If you remember from the first turkey trip that we have taken uh, last year, the Lord spoke to us about taking nothing for your journey. And in faith, we took nothing. We took a backpack and a Bible. It means we, for three weeks, wore the same underwear. It means we did have a toothbrush, but that was our toothbrush. We had no extra shirt. We had no money. Not even a credit card on us. What we had were our Bibles. So, as I'm looking at this scripture, I found seven divine directives from Jesus. You want to go through them? Yeah. Okay, good. The goal is to succeed under supervision of your rabbi, not succeed by the protection of your own strength. We have an obligation to live according to the heavenly pattern. Number one, he said, take no staff. That means nothing to protect yourself but the word. Amen. It is your authority. Yes. Number two, he said, take no bag. Amen. Nothing to comfort you but the word. It will be a light into your path. He said, take no bread. Man does not live on bread alone, but feast on the word of God. Yeah. It is your source of life. Number four, he said, take no money. This means no backup plans. 
We will not back up. We will not let up. We will not shut up. Holiness is the goal. The kingdom will advance. We're going to burn our bridges. No turning back here. We've already given it all. We've lost it all for the sake of Christ. Number five, no extra tunic. Be clothed and lavished by the word. Number six, no reservations or accommodations. Say it with me. No reservations or accommodations. Number seven, no expectations. Let's go through it so that we can uh, build memory on these things that when you're going to preach the gospel, if you have an arsenal of supplies, you're probably going wrong. So I will say no staff and you will repeat and then we'll move down the list. Amen. No staff. No staff. No bag. No, bag. no, bread. no bread. No money. No, money. no, extra, tunic. no extra tunic. No reservations or accommodations. No and no expectations. no expectations. When you have been directed, you have been divinely discipled to demolish demonic dominions, to decapitate his dogmas, to destroy his domain. When you walk out of a domicile, the devil will know that he has been defeated by a descendant of David, divinely directed and discipled to dominate the dignitaries of darkness. Direction defeats the devil. Say it with me. Direction defeats the devil. Say it again. Direction defeats the devil. That's going to be a mantra for me. Direction defeats the devil. And if you can take direction, there is nothing that you cannot conquer. Even the lie her himself. You can conquer him. But you have to have the grit to be able to take correction in your life. There's something else I found. Direction drives disciples. Yeah. It's about to get good. Yeah. Say it's about to get good. <laughs> Let's revisit John 8, verse 31. To the Jews who had believed, believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teachings, you are really my disciple. Start examining yourself. Are you holding to the teachings? If you are, amen, keep going. We need each other. Yeah. We need the encouragement of seeing fruit in our brother's lives. We need the encouragement and the support to run this race together. But if you have let slack in the rope, if you have not been doing your discipleship helps or stressing over your acts homework or not doing your acts homework to the last minute because all you want to do is get it done so you don't make a fool of yourself, then how can you be a disciple? Direction drives disciples. And if you are being driven by the teachings of Jesus, there is great hope for you. You remember Ecclesiastes 12, 11? Let's go back there. Oftentimes it's beneficial to look at other translations. And I, I felt the Lord stirring me up about this scripture and that there was something deeper there. That their collected sayings are like firmly embedded nails. Amen. It's powerful. It impacted me. It changed me. But I began to study... And as I looked at the Hebrew words, even with Justin Triester, didn't make sense. <laughs> this is a difficult translation. And as I read the preceding verses, I saw there was a great relationship between the Lord and the teacher. And a great relationship that was intimate between the teacher and his students. And I read this verse in the NASB, and I want you to hear this. Listen closely. The words, of the, the words of wise men are like goads. And masters of these collections are like well-driven nails. Amen. They are given by one, one shepherd. Did you hear that? 
masters of these collections. Collections of what? The teachings. The, teachings the masters of the teachings. Have you mastered the teachings that have been given to you? I would go as far to say you haven't. Our teachers haven't mastered them. They're still learning. They're still receiving yeah. revelation from the heavens. Yeah. And when they receive it, uh, they're overjoyed to share it with you. Yeah. But for the very foundational things, have you mastered them? The things that we didn't have to wrestle with, you didn't have to toil with, but they had been wrestled with by your teachers and presented as a, as a clear teaching. And you get to receive that. And what that does is it furthers the gospel. Because where your starting place is, is way, way further than where your pastor started. Yep. And that is a blessing. Yeah, it should yeah. fill you with joy. You should never don the doorstep of your pastor's home, just burdened that you have to be there. They want the best for you. Yeah. And they are willing to pour out the very best for you. So have you mastered your teacher's teachings? Do you take their direction lightly? Or perhaps you wince at the thought of divine direction you're coming your way. For the sake of God's name, we must devote ourselves to discipleship. Yeah. Amen. Once we are equipped with the teachings received from the heavens, we can lead others as one well-driven, immovable from the standard of God. Yeah. Do you want to be immovable tonight? Yes. Do you want to be well-driven nails? Yes. Amen. Let's go to Isaiah 20, 24. This will be fun. 22, verse 20. In that day, I will summon my servant, Eliakim, son of Hilkiah. I will clothe him with a robe and fasten your sash around him and, and hand your authority over to him. He will be a father to those who live in Jerusalem and to, and to the house of Judah. I will place on his shoulder the key to the house of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. I will drive him like a peg into a firm place. He will be a seat of honor for the house of his father. I will drive him like a peg. What's another name for a peg? Nail. Nail. Nailed it. Rob nailed it. Let's go to John 20, 25. We're called to be well-driven nails, to master the teachings of our teachers, to take that teaching to the nations, to watch salvation and light dawn in the darkness. Because direction, he beats down the devil. Amen. It whoops him. Amen. Verse 25. Nailed it. Nailed it. So the other disciples told him, this is Thomas. We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. Thomas had not taken hold of what Jesus was teaching him, but Jesus still made sure that he got the revelation. Amen. He came back and he said, Thomas, I've given you my best and you still have not got it, but I will not give up on you. Here, this is where the nails went. Give me your hand. Put your fingers in it. Feel my side. I was pierced. Do you see it yet? Do you see it yet? I want you to be a well-driven nail. I want to use you to take the gospel to India. I want to have confidence in the things that I taught you that you are getting the revelation and implementing it in your life so that you can magnify my name among the nations. Even in the moments where you feel like a failure. You feel like you're overwhelmed with the amount of teachings. You can never do it. You'll never be as smart as that other guy. I wasn't blessed like them. I'm a nobody. Realize that the good teacher 
will do everything to make sure that you get the revelation, Amen. that you have what you need. Amen. Does that move your heart? Yes. Does, that, does that raise the, the level of affection in your heart for this body? Yes. You could truly say, I love this church, and the reason I love it is because the teaching that we're getting is going to change people's lives for the better. Yeah. It's not going to leave them in a damned state. We can actually have hope and confidence that we are walking in salvation, bearing fruit in every good work. We can have confidence in that. Amen. If you hold to the teachings, Jesus said you are a disciple. If you hold to the teachings, Amen. it is simple in concept, but it will cost you your very life, your last breath, everything that you've ever hoped for yourself. It will cost you everything. Jesus paid a high price. We must pay a high price. Yes. But what that transaction produces as you lay down your life is eternal salvation. Amen. And without that death in your life, there is no hope for you. Now, to the young men and the young women in the room, this is a charge for you. You have it far better than many in this room. Do not take it lightly. Amen. Do not take it lightly. You have such a head start in receiving such amazing revelation. You can end up at the age of 12, 15, 16, being at the place where some of us are or were when they were 40, or for me, at the age of 26. Yeah. I had to sit around doing absolutely nothing for the Lord for 24 years before someone came and woke me up. And it saved my very life. It gave me confidence in what lied ahead. Amen. Are you indebted to your pastors? I want to do a quick exercise with you. If you've been in the Acts 2 class, you'll understand this. But for everyone in the room, I'm going to read Matthew 13, 52. And as I read it, I want you to close your eyes. This isn't a call to salvation, I promise. I'm not going to make you raise a pinky. Jesus died publicly. You will confess him publicly. When we have an altar call, I'm going to give a charge that you should repent publicly in public fashion. Don't let the little girl beat you to the altar. We're going to be bold men and women who are set on the glory of God and will settle for nothing less. But as I read this, I want you to close your eyes. Or if you're nervous, you can just squint. <laughs> he said to them, Therefore, every teacher of the law who has been instructed about the kingdom of heaven is like, an, like the owner of a house who brings out of his storeroom new treasure as well as old. Okay, so you can open up your eyes. Who did you envision in that scripture? Who was the teacher? Was it Pastor Matt wearing tassels and a big prayer shawl? Yes. Did you picture Eric or Wade? Did you picture a Jewish rabbi with uh, a very neat hat and a long beard? I know when I first read that, I always pictured someone else in those shoes. But the goal of the gospel and the goal of discipleship is that you become that teacher Amen. You, yeah. I'm speaking to everyone in this room, that you become that teacher who has been equipped by pastors, rabbis, uh, people who have been doing it longer than you, Amen. to be the teacher and pass it on to someone else. Amen. In this Talmudim series, I want to exercise a homiletic as we walk through uh, the take in, attach, lavish model. Implement, direct, initiate, magnify. When you're taken in, you're brought into the hand of the teacher like a nail. Attach. We attach ourselves to a calling and in turn become aligned with ours. We are lavished with direction as our point of impact comes into the teacher's crosshairs. Yeah. He's lining you up. Model, we are set in place to be divinely driven and the hammer is raised to the heavens. 
Do you feel the tension in that? Discipleship is getting more and more intense. Implement. The hammer strikes the nail, but it remains in the teacher's hands. It's the beginning of the implementation of their walk and their teachings. As we come across direct, every drive is getting more intense, more difficult, more abrasive. You're getting hit harder. The direction's getting harsher. But you have been taught and implementing so you are strong enough to take it. And what that produces is driven disciples. As we come to the place of initiation, the nail has been driven enough where the point of impact of the nail and the nail head no longer has room for the teacher's hand and he removes it. And you're able to stand alone. You've been driven far enough, further, far, uh, far enough, but there's much driving left. You're in the final blows and the hammer striking as hard as he can, making sure that you hit your mark, that you're sunk well. You're a well-driven nail. It's everything you've trained for. You're at the pinnacle. You're almost done. You've almost proven something. And we come to magnify. And the nail is sunk like a light in the darkness. We have much to consider when we talk about mastering the teachings of our teachers to be a well-driven nail. I know I want to be a well-driven nail. Because not only are people in other nations, which is my call to go to the nations, to proclaim the greatness of God, not only is it, is it, are they counting on me, it's up to me. But unless I go, no one's going to wake them up. That's right. They stay damned. They stay stuck in their sin. And every night, as I struggle with the teachings that are being poured out on me, I have to live with the fact that my pastors are waiting for me to master them. For me to continue taking direction until I have been perfected. And when I've been perfected and studied to show myself approved, they can swing that hammer as hard as they want and they can sink me into the heart of the Middle East like light in the darkness. Amen. You know that your discipleship is completed. When you are able to take old teachings, old revelations as well as new, and fasten them together like two pieces of the puzzle, Amen. masterfully, Amen. nailed together, fastened, immovable. Amen. Amen. Stand, us with, stand up with us tonight, church.